Hi everyone, uh, thank you for, for joining today's webinar and our information session on our Masters of, of Internet of Things or the Masters in Electronic and Computer Technology. My name is Catherine Cullen and I'm a Programme Director with Technology Ireland Digital Skillnet, formerly Software Skillnet. And we work with DCU to develop this programme to, to join the programme. Uh, just a quick run through of the agenda. I can switch, yeah. So we're going to give a quick, quick introduction into what Digital Skillnet do and, and how we work in partnership with DCU. Then Professor Derek Malloy, who's the program director for this master's, is going to give the program overview, uh, give you a little bit better understanding of the, the modules uh, and what to expect and the entry criteria for, for this master's. We're delighted to be joined then by Paul Sheridan, who is the Technical Commission Program Manager at Accenture. And this is a really important element of the, of the webinar to get that industry insight and see how IoT is being applied as it stands today. And then we very much welcome uh, Q&A towards the end so that you can address any questions if there's nothing that we've, if there's something that we haven't covered on the program. Okay, so a little bit about, about who we are. Um, so we are a business support network um, of Skinnet Ireland, and we are mandated to support the tech industry and industry in general to ensure that they have the talent and the skills required in order to advance um, their mandates in industry, their competitiveness and, and innovation. And, and I suppose if we look at the transition of digital Skinnet and how we've operated um, whereby we had a, a cohort of pure technology companies that we used to work with. Um, what we're now seeing and, and our calls from the industry is it's, it's multi-sectorial. It's not just technology because technology is at front and center of every industry in Ireland, whether that be manufacturing, um, retail, hospitality, pharma, med tech, whatever it is, we, there's a, a, a strong element of technology within that. So we would receive, um, we're ultimately funded by government, and um, we would partner with our promoter Technology Ireland, who are the technology strand of IBEC. So everything that we do is very much industry led. Um, so for example, companies will come to us to with uh, training requirements, uh, and we would either kind of facilitate grant aided programs that are off the shelf, or work with them to provide something that's a little bit more bespoke and tailored to the particular technology or the trend or the industry that that company works within. But all the while, the core part of what we're doing is trying to address the talent and skills development for the digital sector in, in Ireland. So on an annual basis, um, our KPIs ensure that we would develop programs and facilitate programs and training to support over 2000 technology and industry related staff. Um, and they would all be through either our, our part-time academic programs or more bespoke and um, online ad hoc type of training. Our most recent and um, development that you may have seen a little bit about us online would have been through um, an academic program on digital transformation and, and innovation, where we recently trained almost 1,000 staff in, in Dell on the fundamentals of, of digital transformation. And then we would have other e-learning um, modules such as tech learn and we're very strong in the diversity sector where we would host programs um, such as women reboot and women tech start so that's a little bit about, about what we do um, and it's what we would say is that we're seeing a huge support and a mandate from government to maintain the level that we're at and even to expand it so that's what we're seeing in, in the suite of programs that we're currently working on so the DISTA program with DCU has been developed over the, the past number of years. Um, and we're probably, I think we're in our third year now of, of development and, and, um, and activation of the program. And why we're involved in it at this level is to ensure that we can apply the grant aid to eligible participants. And also to almost support candidates as they're applying for the program, because as Derek will get into, it's, it's quite a bespoke um, master's and um, it's very much it's a full stack um, introduction into the Internet of Things and how it can be applied in industry. Um, and we very much want to ensure success in the program. 
So we would typically meet candidates up front and to apply via um, Technology Ireland if you skim at our website and to assess your eligibility for grant aid, but also to assess that you are aware of the, the content of the programme, the, uh, the effort that's required um, to participate and be successful within the programme over, over the two year period. Um, so applications are open now. We have quite a few applications in and we're starting to meet those candidates. Um, and we would like to be in a position to um, finalise the first round, to feed the first round of candidates into the programme by the end of June or the 26th of June. In terms of grant aid, uh, once the eligibility criteria that we, that we look for is that you're working in the industry, that you're working for an Irish registered company, and that you have a role that's adjacent to the, to the program and it's something that you can apply your learnings through. So with the grant aid, the, the fee per year is 3,150 euros. So when we meet you, um, we'll have a quick 15 minute call. Uh, I'll be able to determine on the call your eligibility for grant aid and your eligibility for, for progressing onto the program for assessment. And, and Derek will get into, into that as we go through the call. Uh, and then I'll issue with the instructions and the links for applying for and registering for the program on the DCU um, links and website. And then we'd be in a position to turn around that decision and uh, within a number of weeks and get that offer distributed out to you. Once you get the offer and it's signed, then the invoice process um, takes place. So that, that's kind of it in a nutshell, um, but go through the, the steps with, with Derek, um, listen to how, uh, important the Internet of Things is when you hear Paul discussing that of what it means to him and, and his role in, in the industry. Uh, and then feel free to apply and have that call with us um, and we'll address any further questions that you would have and, uh, and get you through the application process. So that's, that's it from me. I'll, I'll hand you back to, um, to Derek now, who is probably going to be doing the, the, the key part and describing the, the modules and the effort required to, to go through this program and be successful. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Hopefully you can all see my, just adjust a little bit. Um, hopefully you can see my screen okay. Uh, one second. Um, okay, just, just to kick off, this is the uh, MSc in IoT. That's the informal title. And the formal title is an MSc in Electronic and Computer Technology. And I'll explain the reason for the different titles uh, shortly. Um, my name is Derek Malloy, as Catherine and Schuess. Thanks very much. And thanks to everyone for attending today and for hopefully um, you, you'll get something from this. And clearly I'll be available for any questions either in the session or you can email me um, at just derek.malloy, two O's, two L's at dcu.ie. So that's my email address if you need to contact me directly. Um, so I'm a professor in the School of Electronic Engineering. And as Catherine said, I'm, I'm the program director. I'm responsible for the academic uh, content, academic design of the program. And um, I'm, 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 very much uh, research active in the IoT space and the idea is that that experience and the experience of all the academics in the space is used um, to keep this program up to date, current and very much at the leading edge. Uh, so many of you will already know what the IoT is or the Internet of Things is, but just in case, um, you know, and it, it, this isn't the easiest thing in the world to define because it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And, and Paul will give you some nice examples of, of IoT as it means to him. Uh, but effectively, what, when people talk about the IoT, they're talking about devices talking to each other, some sort of machine to machine communication with a, with a large scale. So at, from a technical challenge point of view, that brings in the scale of the number of devices. It brings in the, um, the, um, the, the sort of the web services, the internet services, the part of it, it brings in the whole area of machine learning as it affects the internet of things. Everything comes together with many, many devices. So, you know, as it's described formally, it's a new paradigm, which it's, means it's, a, it's sort, sort of a, it's the next generation of the internet and it involves billions of devices working together, talking to each other, probably without human interaction and ideally in the background without us having to do very much as, as humans interacting with it. 
Um, and, and you know that's 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 kind of what it is uh, in terms of you know a, a short summary of what it is. It's where our um, world is somehow interfaced with to with electronic devices. So that could be physical in the home environment. That could be, for example, smart light switches, smart sockets, you know, temperature sensing, climate control. Uh, anything to make your life easier and sort of, you know, if things go very well, this would fade into the background and you wouldn't even know it exists. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's it's integration of the cyber world and our, uh, our physical reality. And the application space is huge. You know, people, when they think of Internet of Things, they often think of smart home, but that's probably one of the smallest markets where this is applicable. Uh, you can see this this will have an impact on smart cities where it affects traffic and services industrial internet or you know industry 4.0 as it's sometimes called how manufacturing devices communicate with each other identify that there's you know issues on the on the line you know it's to deal with up just in time manufacturing there's so many impacts in in internet 4.0 um, even in the wearables in the bio space where you have people wearing smart devices, people will be used to Fitbit and devices like that. But there's so many more opportunities in the whole medical devices space and, you know, in the connected health space. So it, it's a huge area, um, uh, it, absolutely huge area of, of applications and technologies. And there's a huge range of technologies that are involved uh, in bringing about the Internet of Things. So it isn't just one little uh, this this Internet of Things is with us for the next next decades. It's not it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, so the title, as I said, the, the the unofficial title is the MSC and IoT, and that's generally how we talk about it in DCU. But we have given it an official title, which is an MSC in Electronic and Computer Technology. Part of the reason for that is we want to make sure that your your uh, degree award uh, will have currency into the future. Um, and you know the title MSc in Electronic and Computer Technology will be present no matter what evolution. So for example, let's say you had a master's in the IoT and someone says, well, and then the IoT version two emerges and someone says, well, hold on, your degree is no longer relevant because it's for IoT version one, not for IoT version two. We don't want that to happen. So uh, as a result, we, you know, it's general practice within the universities that we place general titles on programs and then we we add, uh, you know, a, either a major or, or, or a, a note to say what it is at the current. So in the future, you can represent it as you see fit. So all of the, the you know, we're focused not on current tools, but we're current, we're focused on the theory and the, the, the technologies and, you know, the future directions of this space. So we're not tied into one particular platform or one particular product. So your, your knowledge that you get from this is applicable as a general program as well as applied to the IoT. Um, but in terms of learning for this program, um, we, we, we have really focused on the, you know, IoT as an application area for all of these technologies and techniques that we, 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 um, uh, we have modules on. So for example, if you, if, if you were to ask me what is special about this program, the most special thing about this program is that we cover the full stack of IoT. Everything from the device communicating to the real world, the device capturing data through subjects like DSP and, and processing data, uh, to the devices communicating with each other through uh, network communication, to the devices communicating to the cloud, um, through web application development. We, we, we have modules in all these areas. We bring in machine learning. We even have a new module this year on blockchain technology. So we do everything right from the hardware, right through to the software and right through to the cloud and machine learning side of, of IoT. So, so that's not normal. You know, that's not the normal when people talk about IoT programs. Generally, people are talking about sort of cloud-based programs that look at IoT data but we're actually dealing with right from the physical devices, the mesh networks, you know, the edge routers, border routers, right through to the, you know, the the uh, cloud uh, side of the of the um, of of the problem set, and that's that's important because it's 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 really good to get a full feel of of all of the different technologies and skills involved, you know. Um, as I said, you know, DCU is a research active university. All our academic staff uh, are engaged in leading edge research. And a master's program 
is a way that we have of actually of imparting that knowledge to students. So at the undergraduate level, things are more traditional, you know, when you're dealing with modules on mathematics or electronics, it's a traditional coverage. But at the master's level, it's very much an up-to-date current treatment of topics where you're applying them to real problems as they emerge. And, you know, nothing is changing as fast as the IoT in terms of the content that we deliver. You know, the, the, the new technologies, new approaches that are coming in, um, it, it just changes a huge rate. And the only way we can actually do that is by having research active staff who are actually engaged in, in researching in that area and bringing and engage in commercial side of research as well in that area and bringing that knowledge to the program. The other, the other factor that this project program that's very uh, useful is, is, is quite flexible in terms of the entry routes, timings, and deliverables. So we, we've had uh, experience of teaching master's programs in our school and in our faculty for quite some time. And we know that the demands that industry puts on you at times and family life and ex, you know, other, other, other demands that are not just around university life. You know, it might be different when you're an undergraduate student going through um you know a four-year degree program where you, you know, your life is centered around your program but that's not the case often for master students so there is there is slightly more flexibility in terms of the modes of delivery the online nature of the program delivery the engagement with the materials and indeed the opportunity to to uh, to reset or to defer modules as needed given uh, real um, world demands so the program is flexible in that respect and there you know it is supportive of people who are part-time working in industry as well as that we've also tried to build the project elements around the fact that you're working uh, and that it will be good if you could integrate your work environment into the project elements of the program so that you can actually you know um, apply your knowledge to problems that are very relevant to your life and, and that you have very good knowledge of. So that's, that's important too, that we take that into account. And that's been part of the core program design. Um, so the duration of this, it's a, it's a, it's a full master's uh, and a master's um, it, it, it involves 90 credits of, of learning. So 90 credits, this is defined for us to have, for this degree to have, to, to, to be um, recognized in Europe and in America and where, all around the world, uh, we have very fixed um, rules in terms of how we deliver and what our credits mean and what a, a master's means. Um, so effectively an MSc um, takes two calendar years and, and the word calendar is really important there because it's not too, what, what, what you might remember from your undergraduate where you, you studied from September to the following June, this is two 12 month uh, years where the summers actually are involved in the program as well with the project elements. So it's 24 months in total. Um, and that's how we managed to complete the 90 credits of, of learning within within two years. Um, you know, Typically, if you go to France or Germany to do a master's, it'll take you two full uh, years to do it full time. Um, so you know, it's, it, there's a fair bit of work, as Catherine alluded to at the start, um, to get a master's, um, and it's it's important that that's discussed up front, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's also based on the same model as our successful part-time uh, master's. So we, as I said, we have experience of this in the school. We've been teaching online since 1997, which is pretty good, be, considering the internet really only emerged, uh, or the World Wide Web, I should say, only really emerged in the kind of mid-90s. Uh, so we've been delivering online for quite some time and we have good experience of this and it served us well when we had to go fully online in the university for COVID-19 you know when the situation arose but again we have experience of that and we know what it's like um, to to be on a program like this so for example in the case of delivery of modules we do think we have real on-campus lectures um, when when we can we can't at the moment given COVID-19 uh, but we have real on-campus lectures and we record them we do screencast recording and voice recording of those lectures so the materials change every year and that's in the nature of a master's in an engineering space like this where the content changes all the time so these lectures, students can attend those lectures if you're available. Uh, if you're local to Dublin, you can attend those. Um, or you can 
which is usually the case, people watch the screencast recordings and engage with the online tutorial materials as well uh, as part of as part of the delivery of materials. We do all of our we have our own internal uh, virtual learning environment or VLE that we support through DCU call loop and all our materials, all the assignments, all the exercises you have to do, all the self assessments are made available through loop. So we have a single sort of portal for all of the learning materials and you know we it allows for feedback on assignments it allows for for interaction in in discussion forums um, and we use open source and hardware wherever we can to ensure that people can actually do practical exercises so for example in my module students actually build things as part of their as part of their um, modules and actually experiment with real hardware as well as working with software environments that are open source so you can install everything you need on your home machine on your laptop and work through the materials um, there's also terminal examinations and um, they're typically on campus and um, so that would be in january and june this year and uh, for the last uh, 13 months or 14 months we've been working completely online so we've we've held the exams remotely online um, uh, but I can't guarantee that that will continue. It's more likely that we'll go back to on-campus exams in, in January and June, just to, to, to meet sort of um, regist registry requirements. And there's a reset session in August. So if, for example, you had to defer a module or you failed a module in the first or second semester, there's a makeup opportunity in, in August as well. So that's the general delivery. Um, in terms of the overall structure, as I said, it was it's 24 months, so you have to complete. So there's 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 a few different elements you have to complete. You have to choose nine modules um, in, in total, so it's nine taught modules, and then there's two other project modules uh, that you have to complete over the summer months. So if you take the nine modules, that's over four semesters. Um, and you can imagine nine doesn't go, you can't divide nine equally uh, neatly by, uh, by, by four semesters. So that's why it says here two or three modules, two or three modules in each of the four semesters. So typically you'd have to do two modules in each semester, but one in one semester, you'd have to give over uh, to do a third module in that semester. And that could be to suit your own uh, life plans or your own your own workload um, demands and so on. So in one of these semesters, it'll be particularly uh, tough in that you'll be doing three modules instead of two. So each module is um, is about, and I think this is the easiest way to work it out. And it's not the same for everyone. For example, if you're coming into this program and you're you're a professional programmer, you're not going to spend you know a huge amount of time on the programming module you know that's not going to be the case but if it's your if you haven't done programming for a long time or it's new to you you're going to spend additional time on that module so depending on your background uh, you'll spend more or less time on each module but approximately a, a good rule of thumb is you're expected to work about 10 hours per week per module so that would be 20 hours per week over the semester one and 20 hours per week over semester two. The summer project, the first project runs for one month in June. It's a, it's a, it's a shortened session and that's where you frame your project. Then you would do another two modules in semester three. <clears throat> so in your second year, another two modules or three modules in semester four in your, in your second year. And then finally you do the last project element, which is over sort of, uh, this would be July and August uh, sort of time of the final summer months. So that's, that's roughly the way the program is laid out over the two years. Um, a good bit of work, but um, hopefully very engaging uh, modules, very, uh, very informative modules. And hopefully you'd get a good feel for, um, you, you'd get it. You, you, well, you will be expert in IoT after you do this. So, as I said, just to go back one second, and and this is to give you an idea of the type of materials that are covered. You're doing nine modules. There's twelve modules available. You have to do nine and the project elements. Okay. So this is the full set of modules that are available. The, these are the twelve modules in green, and and I think it's a kind of a purpley color up here in the top. Um, they're the twelve modules, and you have to do the project elements at the bottom. So as I said, this is the project element in the first summer. This is the project element in the second summer. So very much, um, you know, it's it's seven and a half credits here. So it's about four weeks, and it's about ten weeks work in the second in the second year. Okay. So the project elements, everybody has to take them. It's a requirement. Then there are two sets of modules. Some of them are uh, what we call supporting modules. These are 
level eight modules. So they would be typically late level undergraduate modules. You can do up to four, a maximum of four of these, and you have to complete at least five of the modules on the right hand side. So that's that's the simple. So you know everybody's doing the project at the bottom. So you have to do up to four, a maximum of four of the ones on the left hand side, and you can do at least five. So for example, to get to the nine, you could do five, you could do five of these and four of these, or you could do six of these, and you could do three of these if you so wished. And um, the choice is up to you, depending on what your background knowledge is and what your skills are. So if I run through them fairly very quickly, you'll see we have these two modules, which we call essential skills and competencies. So we really encourage students to do these two modules in particular. Um, unless you've just, unless you're, if you're a pr professional programmer and you want to work somewhere else and you've done, you kind of got a good knowledge of C++ and Java, you can skip these if you feel that you have the knowledge. But effectively, we're asking students to engage with object-oriented programming, embedded systems, and mathematical techniques. These are skill building um, modules at the beginning, along with then, you know, some of these, depending on your, your interests. For example, if you're interested in wearables, you might do the module on bioelectronics. If you're interested in cloud and cloud integration, you can do web application development. And if you're interested in the network in particular, wireless and mobile communications is very important. Uh, the core modules of which you have to choose at least five include connected embedded systems, which is uh, about the device talking to the world, talking to the network. Uh, real-time DSP, which is about the device communicating with the real world in a, in a real-time manner. Data analytics and machine learning is about once you have that data from your Internet of Things network, how do you process it? Do you do it as sort of a manual data analytics approach or do you do a, a machine learning a, you know, a, a, a approach to it? Um, um, an automated approach to extracting the information about your data. Um, network stack implementation looks at the network and the communications at, at kind of advanced levels. Uh, security for IoT, you can't, you can't talk about IoT without talking about some sort of security. It's obviously an area where there's a huge opportunity for, for, for um, security breaches. So security is very much part of the, the, the program. And in that module, you cover everything from secure communications to security frameworks. Uh, we added a new module this year on blockchain, um, which is proving to be interesting and important for elements of the IoT in, you know, in different parts, but there's challenges because you're dealing with constrained devices um, and so on. So the blockchain scalability looks at blockchain, but it looks at it as a scalability problem as well to say, well, hold on, how do we expand blockchain from sort of currency-based implementations to more general implementations where you've got uh, a lot of embedded small devices that don't have much processing power. They can't be doing very very uh, complex mining. So blockchain scalability is, is very much related to the IoT. And then finally, we, we looked at the, the, we have a module on entrepreneurship, which is, which was very much an industry driven demand of the program that, you know, that we have that students, once they have all this knowledge of the IoT domain, how can they build business cases against that? And that, that was a demand by um, large scale multinationals, as well as SMEs. And that, you know, within a within a large scale multinational, how do you think about all these techniques in a, in a sort of a, a business way that you could apply them then to a particular problem within the within the company? So a good range of 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 modules here, and you can see that there's everything covered from the programming of devices to the devices communicating with the real world to the network communication, either wireless or over a, a sophisticated stack. Um, to the web side, which is web application development, um, to the data analytics and machine learning side, integration with security, blockchain, overall business uh, impact, and even down to the level of wearables is covered within the program. So it's very much a full stack IoT uh, program, and I hope that is useful. Uh, just to give you a feel for things in case that you're, uh, you, you would like to get a, you know, I, I think that one of the questions I get most often is, do I have the programming level required? And uh, one, of the, one of the ways that you can judge that yourself is um, this module E42, Object Jointed Program with Embedded Systems. This, this is a module I teach and I deliver in semester one, and it's very much to bring people up to speed with object-oriented programming. Um, it's 36 hours of lectures, two assignments. 
when it's on a terminal examination. But here's a bit that could be useful for you. This is an older version of the module uh, at this address, ee402.eeng.dc.ie. If you go to that and you have a look at the content and see that you could be comfortable with it, well, then you'll have a good feel for if you if you um, are, are happy with the, with the type of material. So that's available. That's public to the world. It's an older version of the module. And it just gives you a flavor of, of the demands of the program, okay, in terms of the programming skills. Um, another module I deliver onto the program is Connected Embedded Systems. It's where we actually talk about the, um, the devices connecting to the real world, connecting to device, connecting via sensors, but also talking to each other and talking to the cloud using um, you know, um, mesh network technologies or, or talking to the cloud using um, application layer communication like MQTT, for example, or co-op. So we look at all those things. We look at platform as a service. Um, uh, we have 36 hours of lectures in this, two assignments, and then thermal study, independent study. So you can see that's the kind of typical level of engagement is about um, three hours of formal content per week over 12 weeks. Uh, with an expectation it's going to take you time to understand that material and to work on the assignments and so on. And these are supported by my own books in this area. Um, the com project components, I'm just going to go through this quite quickly. Again, very much industry-based. We're trying to tie it into your workplace environment. We're trying to take your knowledge um, or a problem you have in your area and then say, well, hold on, how can you apply the, the, the content you're learning in those modules? How can you apply that to your particular workspace? Um, so we do this, uh, as I said, we start to define the project with training uh, on project planning and RDNI research development and innovation training in the first year. And this allows you to help frame your project and then you implement your project in the second year after you've completed all of your modules. And that allows you to take the knowledge from the modules and apply it to your particular problem. In terms of academic eligibility, Catherine spoke earlier about the eligibility um, for, for, from Skillnet's point of view, but uh, from the eligibility from our point of view is that you must have a uh, two two or equivalent, which is a, a more internationally recognised as a GPA two point five or equivalent in a level eight primary degree in computing engineering or equivalent cognitive discipline. So that might be physics or some sort of science area uh, or some sort of engineering maths, for example, or computer computer engineering or any, anything that's relevant to the area. Uh, the level eight means it had to be at, has to be at honors level um, and that's a European equivalent. So that should transfer and that determination is made at that level. If you don't meet this level, but you have very significant skills in the area, for example, let's say you have a level seven degree, you may be offered a place. So it doesn't mean that you're ineligible if you don't have a level eight degree. You might be offered a place on the qualifier and that might be able, so, so for example, someone who has a level seven degree in engineering, an ordinary degree in engineering, uh, who has experience, industrial experience of programming and or equivalent, you know, for example, that, this is one example, um, could be offered a place on the program. And in a way that would allow you then to um, sort of get a rubber stamp on your, your, your knowledge against the modules that we're delivering. Um, so that's a qualifier. The good thing about the qualifier is that if you get onto it, you have to transfer from the qualifier to the uh, full program. Um, but if you do it well, if you, you, you have to get above 40% uh, in, in four modules, there's slightly more rules. I'd have to explain the full set of rules to you again. But allowing you to get those, that allows you to go onto the full program with no loss of time. So if you go onto the qualifier, you can still complete the program within the two years. Um, and that's one feature of the qualifier program. Um, Catherine flashed up a slide earlier with the cost. So uh, as I understand it, the overall fees are uh, per year is 3,150. And um, again, the criteria that you'll have to check with skill uh, with, with technology and digital skill net is the is is set out here. So uh, somebody working in private uh, industry. Finally, the, before I hand over to Paul, the next steps that you have to um, you go through is uh, follow this link to digital skill net. You'll 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 search. To be honest, it's easier just to search for skill net and MSC and IoT. That's the easiest way to find it. Uh, you can download the brochure and make any inquiries uh, of Skillnet about your eligibility and submit your CV through that. 
Um, if you have any questions for me, it's just Derek. That you can see my name against just underneath my video again. It's just Derek Malloy at DCRE, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have as well, and obviously to take any questions in the session as well. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I, I, are my handing over to Paul yet? Are there were there any? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Paul, whenever you're ready. Um, Paul has great experience of, of IoT from a commercial side and has the knowledge of our programs as well. You're muted there, Paul. Sorry, just sit. Apologies. Uh, yeah, we can hear you now, yeah. Yeah, uh, my Zoom has disappeared on me. It's a little menu. It's a bit weird the way it does. It just disappears into a small little area. Sorry, apologies. Uh, first lesson is to uh, get your screen up and running. There okay, you so you should be able to see my slides now. Apologies. Yes, Paul. It's all there. Yeah, thanks. There you go. Um, so my name is Paul Sheridan. Uh, this time last year, I was asked by Catherine uh, and Derek to and Anya to come on board and just speak about my experience today uh, in IoT. I have experience as an electrical engineer. In doing so, I actually took on some of the modules in the last year. So this is also about the built environment and how I work with IoT, but it's also about what I've learned in the last year. So hopefully, as you work through this, you'll get a first person perspective. Um, as you'll see in the next slide, I'll, I'll run on to that now. Um, I don't have or didn't have any coding uh, background. I didn't have much kind of computer science background. I, I'm from electrical engineering background. So you can see from, I used to be a qualified electrician. I went back to study. I've been in the UK for 10 years uh, before last year, uh, working on high rise projects, data centers, um, and as part of that, I started to get involved with systems integration, like building management systems, energy management systems, lighting control systems. And then over the last five to six years, you start to hear, OK, OK, we need IoT. Everything needs to get smarter and smarter and smarter to the point where, you know, it was starting to become standard. But even at this point, that's still a really early part of we're still at the very infancy of IoT and building. So. When I did move back home, uh, you'll see I jumped over to Accenture. And since I've been with Accenture, I've been working in large scale healthcare projects. Part of my job and that is a technical commissioning program manager, which essentially means that I go from clients intentions, what they would like to do right through to delivering what the technology might be, meeting with contractors, speaking the technologies through. How will it affect end users? How many times are we going to be like sampling different pieces of data? How many sensors do we need in different areas? What are we trying to track? So my job is very wide and varied. And as you'll see as we work through this, IoT has so much scope for so many different areas that you could do a dissertation in any one of them and probably make a career and a full living and everything else out of the rest of them. So as I work through this, I, some of this is going to be self-depreciating because it's what I've learned in the last year, and but I'm okay with that. Uh, so where do we start? We'll start from the building perspective on this one, because obviously that's close to my heart. And with all good business cases, we'll start with the money. So what you see on screen here is a study was done by JLL in probably about 2017, which again is probably old at this stage, but I still think it's a very useful study. Um, so what you'll see on the left hand side, this is what any one company spends on an employee per day. Now, this isn't per week or anything like that. So typically they'll spend three dollars in this case on energy. That'll be, you know, your water, your electricity, everything else. They'll spend 30 dollars on real estate, which is actually quite interesting to focus on now. Will they still spend 30 dollars on real estate or will decentralization due to, due to home working impact that? And how does IoT come into that? It's a whole different kettle of fish and a whole different research topic. But then we come into the 300 for the people. So people are most companies' greatest asset. Some companies sell generators or TVs or whatever they might sell. But most companies rely on their people's brains. So it's that $300 and it's getting the most efficiency out of people. And that's through making them happy, you know, easy to get to their job, easy to, you know, find things, easy to order stuff to their desk, you know, just making their lives easier. And that might be even while they're still working at home. How can IoT engage people more at home or help them be more productive or get a better work-life balance? So 
that three hundred dollars is effectively what we're trying to focus on now. Because as you will see by the energy and the real estate, they're quite well understood factors. But the people are, as we all know, very complex people. So we must see how IoT can support that. So this is specifically in buildings, and we can see from left to right how the energy, the real estate, and the people. Now we'll focus again over on the right-hand side. We know the energy, so we know we've got HVAC sensors. HVAC sensors can speak to the lighting. The lighting can speak to wayfinding, for example, in using sensors to tell us whether there's somebody in the room or they're not in the room. That might be able to link to your email that will be able to tell you whether or not you've been uh, invited to a calendar invite, which can update whether or not somebody's present in the building. Sorry, I'm getting um, invites. Um, and that can work right the way through to connect to waste, for example, whether or not bins are full, is the bin not, you know, are we wasting time going around the building, emptying bins that aren't uh, full, all these different types of things. But then coming right in over to the right-hand side here, health and well-being, brand and absenteeism, productivity, lo uh, leakage, location services. These are the things that we're going to get the most value out of that $300 and out of people. And even if you think about it now is that probably quite a lot of people are, well, I don't want to go back into an office that, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be 40 people huddled around. And how do I know that that place has been sanitized? Or how do you know all these different things? Well, IoT can enable all of that because you could do, for example, that you have, you've got your two meter sensor around people, the different areas that desks can be given to people. You can also track when the cleaning regimes were done, for example, with ticketing systems via IWMSs. So there's a whole range of things that can come into you know, fruition. And the thing with IoT, and especially in this perspective, and especially what Derek and Catherine are speaking about there, is that it's in its infancy. Nobody, you know, nobody's done this yet. There's people out now trying to crack that. So everything that we speak about is very, very real time. So I think that that's one of the most exciting parts of it. So these next couple of slides are my experience and some of the stuff that I did over the last year uh, with Derek and um, the IoT course. So who makes it happen? Um, the people who make it happen from my perspective and in buildings was always going to be operational technology. So I'm operational. I'm very physical components of building. I used to be an electrician, so very kind of hands on. And up until about kind of four years ago, and probably about this time last year too, I thought we ruled the roost, you know, I thought like, oh, we do the lighting, we do everything else, you know, IT will come and, you know, help us at the end, we'll put all the cables in place. And even though I worked in data centers and saw the, you know, the complexity of them, I didn't quite have a full understanding of the complexity until I started studying IoT. So last year I put this slide up and I spoke about, you know, operational technology. We put the OT and IoT, you know, we're, we're the real, we're the real deal. Uh, but then quite quickly when I started to study IoT, I realized that I was a little bit off kilter there. You know, they started speaking about C++ and GUIs and, you know, Raspberry Pis, Beagle Bones, all these things. And I started to go, wait a minute, you know, where are the cables going and when, how do I, you know, but, Again, I started to realize that the real information and the real stars of the show was the information technology and what was going on in the background and the full stack and how that was impacting decisions being made at the very first conversations that we should be having with clients, we should be able to understand and explain the full stack to them. So this over the last year has been such a learning curve for me, but it's been a really worthwhile one. And I realized you can't spell IoT, but have an I, the, the I and the T at the start and the end of it. And that's what I've learned over the last year more than anything. Um, so if we started to run through where we come in, so where we, as in where you sitting here taking this uh, webinar and listening to us, where is the potential for you to kind of get involved with this? So this is the full stack. And uh, one of the first things I learned when I went into uh, Studio IoT is that there's many different stacks and they, you know, there's seven, there's three, there's different elements and different ways we can do it. But um, this is a kind of typical stack. So if we started on the left-hand side of the engineering devices, so that could be a lighting sensor, which then is fed back to an area controller, which is then fed back to possibly fed back to an edge um, server located down at whatever it might be the building maintenance area. And then we take that from there to go to platforms, big data, how we abstract that, how is that being used within applications? Uh, and is there different APIs which are tying in that to ultimately give you one app and user face that you can change the light and the HVAC and everything else. So there's multiple kind of parallel processes going on at once with anyone. And that's just the lighting device. I mean, we could do that across 
um, quite a lot of different um, systems. And I've learned as well that operational technology and information technology is probably blurring at this point as well, that there's probably not that clear delineation between the two. Um, so in terms of a building business case, and when we sit with um, clients, we, we start with a kickoff and kind of say, well, what does a smart building mean to you? We usually do a couple of circles at that point, uh, and you usually come back to this. So you could be, you know, at level 13, 14, and you still might come right back to the start. But as you work through this, you start to realize just the full stack and the impact of those different elements and the decisions that you're making. Uh, and that can go right through to the devices and the machines that we're using, how many times you want to sample a lighting sensor, or how many times you want to sample, for example, a, a room temperature. Um, how are we going to use that information? Are we going to do platforms? Are we going to do sales as a service? Uh, how, what way are we going to, you know, um, capture people's information? Are they okay with us capturing their information? If we're using RFID, is it okay that we track people? Is it not okay? There's ethical issues. Then that comes into user interfaces. I mean, for me, I go from start to finish. Uh, but you could, as um, Derek has alluded to, with any one of the um, modules on the masters, you could pick any one of them and be happy in your career for the rest of your life just doing those elements. So the course and the elements that Derek and Catherine put together on it are very specific and very industry relevant in terms of how I go about my day to day job. Uh, I've learned so much by just doing, uh, you know, object oriented programming, for example, is just take that one, you know, how different sensors are labeled, and then you understand how a family is and what a class is, and then how sensors can be sub distributed as that it's, you know, it's, it's opened up a whole new kind of understanding for me. And uh, just in the next couple of slides, I was just going to run through, you know, smart cities and different elements uh, that are becoming smarter. So we in buildings have smart cities or not, not quite yet, but uh, that one building can speak to another and, you know, you can share power or offload uh, different times of the day. If we have peak power and we learn from each other that we can actually share power at different times of the day. If I have generators and next door doesn't have generators, can we run off peak or charge batteries? You know, all these different types of things that smart cities could enable. Uh, smart transport, that your car is speaking to the road, the road speaking to your car, your car is then speaking to advertising. The advertiser is then speaking to you as you come down the road. I mean, the, the, the potential of it is, um, is pretty, pretty big. Uh, smart utilities then, obviously, wind, uh, offshore generation, how that's meeting and how that's kind of getting right down to the point of your smart meter in your, in your house and how that's communicating to your neighbours and maybe your whole neighbourhood has a smart you know, utilities and smart meters uh, met method that they use together. Uh, smart factories, which Derek touched on, which is Industry 4.0, where factories are just becoming smarter and smarter. And, you know, slowly but surely, it's not the machine that's taking place of the person, but the, the machine is starting to augment and, and, and help people do the jobs better. Um, so 8% of buildings required in 30 years are already built. So what's the challenge of getting technology into those buildings? How do we do that? Uh, how safe is your data is obviously a huge uh, problem. Uh, I was listening to a lecture with Derek's not so long ago, and he was talking about uh, where a casino's fish tank was uh, hacked and managed to get data. So, you know, everything is becoming open, but is the standards following it? Uh, and IoT for the new normal, as we spoke earlier on about the uh, sensors and such, which could, which could be applied. And again, that's cutting edge. It's, it's as we speak. Um, and a big thing, because I've worked in data centers and I've been all over Northern Europe and seen these things that are colossal, colossal spaces are only getting bigger, is that data alone will consume 29% of Ireland's electricity by 2028. And that, that's a staggering figure. And it's probably increasing every day. I'd say that's probably still, that's pretty low, I would imagine. Um, so with that in mind, I put together this slide, which um, this time last year, I wouldn't have been able to say it to you and being able to understand what it was. So once you read this slide, you can have a look at the bottom and rate yourself on a scale of Paul 2020 to Paul 21. So you'll talk to your Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone and pseudo, but not pseudo C++ in Nano to commit script to some Git from the kernel, maybe make a cute GUI and sniff packets. In ML, you will use Seaborn Pandas and Jupyter with Python wrapped in Anaconda in the cloud or the edge it's kind of a fog. 
And if had you said that sentence to me this time last year, I would have been lost. Uh, but this year, I'm actually quite happy. You can see me jumping for joy in the little corner there. That I do understand that. Um, so from somebody that was an electrical engineer, very kind of focused on building systems this time last year, I now have the complement of them skills to be able to understand that. So the reason nobody is going to turn around to you and say that, you know, I'm an IoT engineer, because if they do, they they clearly don't understand IoT or the scale of it. So there is no unicorns and the challenge is very real for it. And if you had said to me this time last year, it gave me this advice, I probably would have taken it. So it's my advice to you, be brave enough to suck at something new and jump in and get stuck in. There's lots of support there to do it. Uh, so good luck and I hope you take it on. Thanks Paul, that was, that was brilliant.